Welcome back, folks. Uh, Greg Silberman here, CIOs and bow ties, and we are continuing our uh, week-long deep dive into uh, all things biotech, biotech, longevity, gene therapy, uh, viruses, and the like, and uh, continuing along that <laughs> very interesting the uh, thematic. And I've I've learned so much myself just going through this process. So it's been very rewarding and hopefully I'm going to make it rewarding for you, the listener as well. Uh, on the line, we have another fantastic guest. I'd say another uh, thought leader in the, can I call it the longevity space? I, I hope I can. You can correct me in a second, Liz. Um, but let me tell you about Liz Parrish. She is the founder and CEO of BioViva Sciences USA, Inc., BioViva is committed to extending healthy, lifespan, healthy lifespans using gene therapy. Liz is known as the woman who wants to genetically engineer you. She is a humanitarian entrepreneur, author, and innovator, and a leading voice for genetic cures. Strong proponent of progress and education for the advancement of gene therapy. That's something I definitely have a few questions around. Actively involved in international educational media outreach and is a founding member of the International Longevity Alliance. Uh, founder of Biotrope Podcasts, found on iTunes, uh, committed to offering a meaningful way for people to learn about current technologies, a founding me member, as I mentioned, the American Longevity Alliance, a nonprofit trade association. Um, so, wow, okay, powerhouse in the uh, gene therapy space. So, Liz, let me firstly just welcome you on the podcast of CIOs and Bowties. Thanks for having me, Greg. I really appreciate uh, you reaching out and wanting to have the conversation. Excellent. Well, likewise, thank you for, for coming on board. Um, you know, before I dive in, I, I'm just a little bit curious about your background itself. I think you were at the University of Washington. I'm just curious about you know, what you studied and, and how your interests brought you to, to this point where you are uh, so squarely focused on the longevity side of things. And can I call it longevity? Is that okay to call it that? Yeah, I think it's okay, okay to call it longevity. I think it's becoming uh, really uh, known as being in that area, which it, it shouldn't really be separated from health care. Um, as a matter of fact, today we have what I would call sick care. We wait for people to get sick and then we treat them. Mm -hmm. And uh, But biology and the science behind it is moving towards actual health care where we treat you before you get sick. So I did have some biology uh, in my background. I um, was vastly interested in it, but what led me to the present state of uh, being in business with biotech is that from 2011 to 2013, I actually uh, worked for a volunteer program uh, for the advocacy of the use of stem cells. So it was an educational platform uh, used to uh, teach and disseminate information about what stem cells were, uh, that embryonic stem cells were very, very uh, small percentage of the development and that they were in fact not fetuses. Uh, but the major development in the area of stem cells were called autologous stem cells or the patient's own stem cells used in their body. Mm -hmm. And I became super fascinated with what's called regenerative medicine. Mm -hmm. And I started to delve deeper into why stem cells behave the way they did. And I met with epigeneticists. So epigenome means, you know, how it's essentially uh, what genes are turned on and off. Why, why one cell behaves differently than another cell, even though they have the same genes in them. Mm. And, um, I fell in love with genes. I just, I felt, I kept telling everyone, you know, I think we should start looking at the gene therapy sector. But um, my work with the advocacy of stem cells came to a screeching halt in 2013. So two years into the technology when my son was diagnosed with type one diabetes. Mm. And I was thrown into, you know, the world of children's hospital mm -hmm. and seeing all of these sick children around me, mm -hmm. realizing that without modern medicine, my son would be dead. He was dying. And um, I asked about these technologies that I had learned so much about. And I found that they're not really translating to people. As a matter of fact, uh, they seemed rather shocked that I asked. They said, that's experimental medicine. We don't use that in children. Uh, there are kids here that are dying. You should consider yourself uh, lucky that you have a child with a mm. treatable disease. Mm. And you know, it never fit inside my head. And actually they had me at, there are children here that are dying. Um, 
that that was it. Uh, I mean, I knew I knew what I needed to do next. I just didn't know how to get there. We needed to translate therapeutics quickly. And in using a, a title like experimental medicine is nowhere near as uh, dangerous sounding as death. And that's what we do. We, we let, you know, uh, uh, over 100,000 people die every day of aging alone. Right. But more than that, uh, of childhood disease and, and other conditions, um, without giving people access to what's considered experimental medicine. So that then led to two more years of discovery and then probably some more things that we're going to talk about on this podcast. Okay. Well, you know, as I say, uh, adversity breeds opportunity. So I'm, I'm sorry you had to go through that, but uh, also happy that we get to speak about it now. So um, listen, I'm, I'm just going to start with the, the novice gene therapy question, if that's okay. This is really the novice one, and hopefully some of my yeah. listeners are, are, are here where, where I am at. Okay, so, you know, we hear about CRISPR, CRISPR-Cas uh, gene editing. I get that. I kind of understand that. Um, and I know that you've been a guinea pig of sorts for, for some of your own, own treatments, and we'll talk about that. But, you know, I'm, what, what I'm really confused or curious and where you can help me about is this kind of delivery mechanism, right? So I understand you can do some kind of gene editing. That's great. And you can um, selectively put it by there's various means to get it into the body. We'll talk about them now. I think AAV2, um, let me see if I get this right, avino-associated virus is, is one mechanism. But here's, here's the silly question, right? Um, and I know we take a pill for a headache for example, and that pull somehow knows to focus on certain area and, and fix that area. But when you're doing a, distri- um, a distribution mechanism for gene therapy, how do, you get, how do you get it to impact all of the required zone? Um, and you know, how, how do you do that? How do you, how do you treat, how do you distribute the gene therapy? Okay, so so yeah, so I spent the next two years uh, actually uh, discovering uh, information about gene therapy, and I've spent the last five years with this company doing gene therapy. So let's just give a, get the background out of the way so that okay. we can move into how does this how does gene therapy work? Because that's a really good question. Actually, I had somebody ask me yesterday about CRISPR technology. Um, that why why we don't do CRISPR technology and we use viruses to deliver gene therapy and actually CRISPR technology is delivered by viruses uh, the same viruses that we use for gene therapy so that's one that's one question it's in itself to get out of the way but how do we deliver gene therapy so there's there's a viral delivery of gene therapy and it's the the most predictable today and then there's also something called liposomes you can use kind of what's you can think of as fat or, um, you know, lipids in order to deliver gene therapy. And and I'll tell you why we use viruses. Uh, Viruses are the masters of gene therapy. So if you think that you've never taken a gene therapy in your life, you have. Uh, That's what viruses do to your body. They insert their genes and then their genes replicate the virus. And often you might integrate a little bit of it so that you're resistant to it in the future, Uh, but they replicate their, their own genes. Now, Docking up to a cell and putting the genetic information into a cell is actually a difficult thing to do. You can do it with liposomes, but they don't get into the nucleus Mm -hmm. necessarily. Mm -hmm. So we need to get genes with gene therapy. So we want to get a therapeutic gene into the nucleus of your cell. We don't necessarily want to integrate it all the time. We'd use CRISPR if we wanted to. We want to get it into your cells so that gene codes for a protein and those proteins change you. So you are just a product of your genes that are coding for proteins. We look at therapeutic genes uh, that might replace something that the body's missing or upregulate something that causes regeneration in the body. That's what we do in restorative medicine. And we do that by inserting a gene because that will code for the protein that makes you. So what we do with a virus is we take out the virus's ability to replicate. So it cannot make you sick and it cannot replicate. It's called attenuating a virus. So it's no longer a live virus. So even if we put no therapeutic gene and we put it in your body, it couldn't do anything. It can't make more of itself. Mm -hmm. But then what we do is we take the therapeutic gene, the, the human gene of interest, 
I'd argue, any gene of interest in the future. We, we put it into the virus, and now the virus uses its very specialized docking mechanism to get that gene into your cell. So think about this. So you can send anything out into space, but you can't send anything that will dock with the international space sy uh, system up there. So if you want to do that, you actually have to send a device that has a spec special docking mechanism, and that's how cells work. So viruses uh, dock up, they, they give you uh, gene therapies uh, regularly, viruses do, that's what happens when you get a virus, mm -hmm. and we just use them to give you a gene therapy that okay. is beneficial to the organism. Okay, I knew the answer was simple, I was being naive. <laughs> oh, yeah. And then we, we use, uh, so AAV, uh, adeno-associate virus, has uh, many different, they're called serotypes. Uh, today, there are many different serotypes. There's probably over 20 different serotypes. And what we've done with all of those is we, in science, not myself, but in science, they have adjusted them to dock to specific cells. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. So we might have uh, a serotype that that targets the tropism, the tropism being the tissue. The serotype targets the tropism that might be for your muscle tissue or your heart tissue or your skin or your lungs or your liver. Got it. And, and just one last point on that. So when you are in quotation, I'm making air quotations, infected with the gene therapy virus, um, the, that cell that has the new you know, gene coding basically divides, divides, divides and replicates itself. And that's how it spreads throughout the, the organism, the body or the, the desired area. Well, actually, so these are, are non-infectious, uh, so you can't spread them to anyone else. Number one, you're not contagious when you've taken a gene therapy. No, sorry, I mean within the body. How oh yeah, so that that's up for debate. In some cases, uh, the the gene therapy might divide with cells, and in other cases, it may not. It is probably at least as good as the lifetime of the cell that it's transfected. Mm -hmm. When you integrate into the chromosome, now you're looking at uh, replicative uh, gene therapies. So you're looking at gene therapies that will very likely replicate Got with it. the cell to other cells. Uh, when you're looking at an episomal delivery, uh, there is hopes that we can get replication, but that might not be true in all cases. So today there's five gene therapies uh, through the regulatory systems. They're considered a one-time treatment for a lifetime cure. In the future, in the next 20 years, we'll find out whether they are yeah. or not. But that's very, very powerful technology, you can see. Okay. Awesome. All right. Let, let's move on. Thanks for, for uh, the education, Liz. Um, you know, our, our audience are familiar with uh, some of the other works out there. Uh, Dr. Uh, Aubrey de Grey, I believe, he has mm -hmm. what he calls the, the seven pillars of um, aging, if you will. So seven areas which we kind of need to address. Um, and I don't know if you subscribe to that. I suspect you might. But uh, my understanding is that you actually used yourself a, a little bit as a guinea pig for some, some gene therapy. And so the two areas I want to uh, address, let's address them one at a time. One was um, your application of gene therapy for myostatin inhibitor. Can you explain to us what that is, what it does, and, and why you chose that um, therapy? Right. So one of the gene therapies I took essentially to make it really simple, it increases your muscle mass. And the reason that oh, I that took it... Good. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's especially good for an aging population. Mm -hmm. An aging population suffers from something called sarcopenia or muscle loss over time. Uh, also, people with cachexia, uh, they lose muscle mass when they've gone through cancer therapies. And then there's a slew of uh, muscle disorders out there that lead right. to muscle wasting. Every gene that our uh, company chooses actually treats an aging uh, disorder and a childhood disorder. Um, most will treat uh, both uh, moving forward. And the benefit to an aging population with uh, a myostatin inhibitor is, of course, to keep them strong and healthy. So what did it do in my body? Uh, myostatin is a regulator of muscle growth. So mm -hmm. picture it as a protein and it regulates muscle growth, which is really probably good when you're young so that your body doesn't use all of its nutrition bulking up and becoming massively, you know, mm -hmm. 
uh, muscular and, um, and then, you know, not look after other uh, nutritional needs to your body. But as you age and your the myostatin is still upregulated and you start losing uh, muscle mass because you don't have the growth hormones and things like that that when you had when you were younger, um, it becomes life-threatening. I lost a family member uh, to frailty. It was my best friend's mom, but it was considered family to me. Uh, just this last summer, she, you know, she was told that she needed to walk with a walker and um, might have been or might not, but she she fell and and that was it. She hit her head and and it's actually quite devastating. Mm -hmm. And you know, otherwise she was mentally alert and had every other one of her faculties. So um, frailty really does kill people, and it really is an awful thing. And uh, keeping people strong and active is great. So what happens with the gene therapy is you put the gene therapy into your muscle cells. Um, we have a, a, a proprietary way of doing that uh, with patients. And then uh, it codes for something, uh, it's a gene called folostatin. It codes for a protein that actually blocks myostatin. So it blocks the ability of some of the myostatin to regulate your muscle growth. Now we don't block all of myostatin uh, because we don't want to make you like the incredible Hulk, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but we block a healthy amount. And this gene became of interest to us because it was already through safety and efficacy with both Becker's and Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. And that's the childhood um, mm -hmm. interplay. Um, how many treatments, again in quotation marks, did, did you require and how, how, what has the effect been and how long ago was it? So you only require one gene therapy. Uh, the gene therapy was four and a half years ago. Uh, the benefits was increased muscle mass, uh, decreased white fat, lower blood glucose levels, and better A1C. I mean, you know, for my age, I'll be 49 this week. Um, my blood glucose level is excellent, and so are my A1Cs, which is a, a sort of a long-term, you know, effect of, of glucose levels. And this is something that wow. he regulates with everyone as they get older. So uh, that What does was that fantastic. mean, he regulates? Well, you, you basically start to slowly slip into what's called metabolic disorders as right. you age. So mm -hmm. your chances of getting type 2 diabetes goes up exponentially mm -hmm. as do mm -hmm. other, you know, blood sugar related issues and glycation buildup of proteins. So what BioViva, we actually look at the nine hallmarks of aging. Uh, we've expanded it into 10 and those are our cellular targets. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, anything that uh, leads to things like type 2 diabetes, heart disease, cancer, uh, kidney failure, uh, those sort of areas are our targets. I see. Okay, so, well, we'll yeah. go ahead. So we saw basically better blood sugar control and we took MRIs before and MRIs mm -hmm. after we continue to do that. So we don't, BioViva itself does not treat patients. Our exclusive partner called Integrative Health Systems does. And so we continue on taking MRIs as uh, evidence of uh, muscle mass increase and, and white fat decrease, which can be really beneficial to the organism as well. Okay, we'll get into IHS in, in the next segment. But, but the other one that I came across uh, was, a, I guess, a gene therapy which you applied to yourself was uh, related to telomerase. Telomerase, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Can you talk yeah. a little bit about that and, and why that? Sure. So why would a person take a telomerase inducing gene therapy? I was the first person in the world to do it. And it's because telomerase. So, okay. Telomeres are the caps at the ends of all of your chromosomes. And as we get older, they get shorter and they are tied in with what's called the Hayflick limit. So when telomeres get critically short, cells cannot divide anymore and they become senescent. Mm -hmm. It, the only way to, that we know to, to predictably lengthen telomeres is the gene therapy. So it's used by a myriad of companies who are testing small molecules that they want to do the same thing, but they use the gene therapy because you have to at least meet the amount of the gene therapy to lengthen telomeres. The Hayflick limit has now been proven in a multitude of organisms. How many cells can an organism cell divide uh, healthy divisions with cell death in relation to how long they live. And it markedly works uh, across a broad 
spectrum of mammals. And what telomerase does is it not only, so there's, think of the hallmarks of aging. One of the hallmarks of aging is short telomeres. That is one hallmark of aging that we have to address to make an mm -hmm. organism more youthful mm -hmm. and not die of the diseases of aging. But when you lengthen telomeres, it targets five other hallmarks of aging. So it, it has the biggest bang for the buck out of any gene therapy at targeting what's actually happening at the cellular level that is leading to the diseases that we die from. So the gene itself is called HTERT. And what it does is it codes for the enzyme telomerase, which replaces the caps at the ends of the chromosomes. So the, why would these caps get shorter, shorter? It's believed that it's because when the cells divide, there's coding regions to read in order to get a successful copy, as successful as possible, of the mm -hmm. chromosome itself into a new cell. But the caps are probably cut off so that they're not, they don't read the very ends just in case there's a problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this would restore and does restore the ends of the caps of the chromosome. So what are some of the things that I saw from taking that gene therapy? Yeah. Well, number one, we still have a hard time getting gene therapies to all the cells in the body and not all of gene therapies need that. So when you do something like a myostatin inhibitor that we previously talked about to increase your muscle mass, you don't have to get that in every cell in the body. It's a protein that is shared in the bloodstream. And so the whole body benefits. So I had my legs treated, but my arms are bigger too. Uh, they have more muscle. But with telomerase induction, it's not shared. Um, cell to cell or in the bloodstream. So we have to target as many cells as possible. Mm -hmm. So we did see telomere lengthening in my T lymphocytes, which is just a really common way to test telomere length. Uh, we saw them lengthen uh, significantly over the last several years. I mean, it's not, they haven't extended to like embryonic state or anything mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. that, but they did extend um, the length by about 33 years. So that means a healthier immune system. Uh, we saw 50% uh, reduction in my triglyceride levels. And we saw no increase of cancer risk, which is what we predicted would be the case. And since the time I took uh, the telomerase induction, uh, and now uh, there have been a couple more studies out that show that telomerase induction does not increase the risk of cancer. It may actually protect the organism against cancer because one of the hallmarks of aging that telomerase helps with is genomic instability. And you're gonna hear more about that in the future, but essentially genomic instability is one of the hallmarks distinctively of cancer. So when telomeres get short, the uh, chromosome becomes a uh, less stable and mm -hmm. a less stable chromosome is probably why we have such mm -hmm. increased risk of cancer after the age of 65. I, I, I do understand that, believe it or not. And um, yes. again, from, from the, uh, you know, a New York Times article I read once upon a time, the analogy that's always stuck in my head and you'll probably fall off your chair being the, the, the scientist here, but the, the description I glean for, for to long, telomeres is essentially if you look at a shoelace at the end of each shoelace you've got those little plastic clasps or whatever that kind of keeps the the ends from fraying out and so anyway that's the analogy i use i hope it's you know yeah right. right and so when you lose those caps everything becomes frayed and eventually right. you can't, it's hard you can't to thread the shoelace yeah, exactly you can't right. restring it. If it comes out, it's like it's this it's this big mess and it's it's time to get a new shoelace. And at that point, we really uh, would have a hard time getting new chromosomes. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a, it's a really important part of aging. I don't believe that lengthening telomeres itself will uh, cure aging all by itself. Mm -hmm. But I do believe that it does the most benefit. I mean, skin has been restored to a healthy state in animal models. Uh, myriad, uh, cells have been become younger in dish. Cells go on to infinitely d divide and go through cell death, not cancer. Um, with, uh, with telomerase, it's considered immortalizing a cell line. They might not go on forever, but they go on beyond what our Hayflick limit mm -hmm. is. And um, those are all, th that's, that, that is a therapy that is going to have to be a uh, part of any uh, right. true longevity uh, protocol. Got it. 
Okay, Liz, I'm, I'm going to let you take a breath here. We're going to take a short break. Uh, when we're going to come back, we're going to speak a bit more about the commercial side of, of BioViva. So hang with us, and we'll be right back.